Hello, please welcome our next speaker, Florian Festi, who will be talking about new features in RPM in Fedora 24. So, as you may have noticed, we've put a new release, actually not in Fedora 24, but in Fedora 23, which basically means the new features can be started to be used now, because it always takes like a release or something, maybe even two, before the builders get up to date, and you actually can use the stuff without damaging everything and the builds no, no work. So, if we are talking about 24, it's basically 23, plus one. So I'm going to, because the last release was pretty big, new feature wise, because RPM is known to be rather slow moving, but um, not this time. So we'll just start with a lot of, a uh, couple of smaller stuff we will just skip over and then go to the two big things we added, which is file triggers and Boolean de uh, dependencies, which we will dedicate a bit more time to because they are more complicated. So let's just uh, uh, dive into. One thing we added because I, I don't, I think Harald wanted this. Is he here? Harald Hoyer? Yeah, yes. It's probably his fault. Uh, so we uh, added remove path uh, post fixes, which basically allows you to chop up the end of a file name, which allows you multiple file names actually ending up being the same. The problem is, as we have a shared uh, install directory for all the sub-packages, you cannot have the same file with different contents and different sub-packages, which is annoying if you want to ship like different configurations for different use cases. Of course, you want to set conflicts for these packages, but they are, that's a valid use case and you just couldn't do it. And so that's basically the quick fix for this. It's still not 100% as it should because there are implications with dependency generators. <laughs> we don't talk about this. Uh, but I've, so there will probably be, uh, as we will revisit it and, and clean it up. But for the most simple cases, it, it, it just works fine. You basically give a, a, a list of colon separated uh, end file endings that it, they are basically just chopped off when the packages are assembled. Um, as we are as file names, we also enabled the uh, 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 clobbing with, uh, uh, how does it actually called? With this uh, uh, curly, curly braces. Um, uh, then that basically can be used either in the API or on, in the file list. So if you have files which are basically named the same with the exception of some middle part, you can do that now. It's not a big thing, but I've, I think we broke something yeah, I think we, we fixed something else which showed up some packages which used that, which actually never worked, but uh, it was hidden, that, that <laughs> didn't work, and so we said, well, at least as an as a apology, <laughs> we will enable it, and it works now. And another thing that's actually not in the release, but we've backported it, is just now for, for, for the Chilipsy people who are not here, uh, but just as we made it, decided they don't need it anymore, but we basically uh, promoted missing OK to being a full uh, file uh, attribute. Before this, you could have a config missing OK, which means you have a config file that you are allowed to delete, like in some .d directory, HTTPD .d directory, and of course you may want to delete the file, and. The nice thing is with the config, uh, as it is a config file, it's not restored on update. But the uh, Glibc people wanted actually not, wanted to use it for a different use case, and the use case was basically having a translation file that is then merged into some library, and uh, into some, lump, some database, basically. And then you can throw it away to save the space. But if it is a config file, it's not restored. I mean, on an update, you cannot update a database because the file is not even put there. And that was kind of annoying, and now you can basically do that. So the use case is you have data that needs to be merged on installation and then be thrown away. And it's not very much in the RPM spirit, but there are use cases, and uh, so we, we support it now. 
Then there are a couple of other things which are not so much spec related. Um, I did uh, parameters for RPM build, so you can actually do everything you do with the normal uh, uh, building, also from an SRPM. There, you, there also is like rebuild and recompile, but all the, the intermediate stage, the stages could not be passed to the command line. And yeah. so we have basically minus R for rebuild, and so you can basically go to any step to the, from the source RPM. Um, I don't know. It's, it's probably not that important for the for the Fedora workflow, but there are other people building packages under other circumstances. There's another big thing which are those security IMA uh, flags. That's something that was done from IBM, basically. It's, um, it's basically signatures that are put into the file system so the kernel can check that the files didn't change. So it's, it's basically one of the power to make trusted computing actually work. But I don't know if it's Fedora wants to do that. Uh, my guess is not. This is not for directories, right? This is only for files. So it's not securing the contents of a directory. I'm not sure. Is it? I have you have no idea about the details? I have only a very rough idea about the okay. details. More on the what does it break in the RPM AP, uh, uh, code stuff. Not so much what does it break on your system. Uh, no, no, I mean, <laughs> uh, when you're doing this, when you're calculating the, the signatures, uh, you're only doing it for files, right? Not for directory contents. Yeah, right. You cannot do it for directory contents because uh, that's not part. Directory content, in that sense, is not part of a, of a, of a package. So the package doesn't know what, el what everything ends up in the yeah, directory. That, that is a problem because it does not secure the contents of directories. So in case of drop-in directories, you can influence the system very much if you delete a file. So that's, yeah, so it's flawed, the, 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 the concept of it. Yeah, I don't know. The IBM guys actually girl did it. It gives a false security thing. Yeah, so maybe. We will send. We will end up. Maybe we will delete it in like three years because no one uses yeah, it. Well, but it's the first step, yeah. but it's the first step to actually make uh, the files more trusted. Um, so another thing that actually Panu still did uh, was was uh, doing a check for 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 uh, for the uh, encoding. It's currently still disabled in the sense it only gives a warning. But uh, I don't know if Fedora at one time is brave enough they can switch it on and basically prevent. Uh, spec files with funny characters uh, from building um, and make sure they are all properly UTF-8 encoded, um, which is turns up all kind of problems, especially with YUM. Don't know how DNF reacts if it gets crazy stuff from, from, from RPM, because RPM used to not care. So if you just put some randomly encoded bytes in there, you get bytes in, bytes out, RPM just makes a comparison on the bits and is happy if they match or and if it's something else like a description it doesn't even get it, do something with it. And some higher level languages like Python are pretty upset if they get uh, wrongly encoded uh, uh, bytes. Um, so that's a way to, to at least mitigate the problem. Then we added what re uh, recommends and, and what, what supplements and whatever stuff, which we should have added like last year when we added the weak dependencies, but for some reasons, uh, uh, no one noticed that they are missing. So I don't know who, who forgot to check that. So we added that. And we probably still uh, this time forgot them again. But uh, I'll talk about this next year. So then we come to the um, uh, bigger features. One of the large one is, is file triggers. Um, that's something we have tried to do for quite a while. There has been a previous attempt which didn't work out that great, so it's got deleted again. Um, this time we are basically using the same mechanisms we use for normal triggers and just glorify them to, to do more, which has the, the thing is, normal triggers, we always kind of discourage 
them being used. So um, the, the story is the same. So there's this old Disney movie, the old Disney Robin Hood. I don't know if anyone old enough to know that. So the cartoon thing. And there, there's, there's Trigger is a character in there, and it's basically what, what Triggers are. It's one of the town guards, it's a vulture with a crossbow, which is safe and will, will not fire unless you point it into random directions, basically. And that's what the triggers are basically are. So they are sitting there waiting for the wrong thing walking in front. So what are, are file triggers? They are basically scriptlets that are executed if, it's, if files are installed or removed from given locations. So they can basically keep care of uh, places and files being pushed there. And the nice thing is, in, a, um, in opposite to, to normal scriptlets, which are basically tied to the package themselves, they can be centralized and the files can be elsewhere in other packages, so you can basically put the logic in one place where it belongs and, and have all the other packages putting just files there, not caring how it's implemented. So you can actually change things like without going through hundreds of packages and adjust their files. So to understand how they work, you basically need to know how Nurgle triggers work. So they're all but new, but I still will go a bit over them. There are basically um, four of them. The names are a bit odd because uh, historical reasons. So I'm sorry, but uh, we're not changing them. Uh, get used to them uh, or look them up if you need one because no one can actually uh, remember which name actually does what. So they are basically can be run before the package installs, after the package installs, before the package uninstalls, or after the package uninstalls, but the names are kind of weird. Um, also, with as they are scriptlets, they also inherit all the weirdness of normal scriptlets, like the install being done before the array. So that's the drill you all hopefully are familiar with. So that's the next thing to keep in mind. So there comes some baggage with that, but that's how it is. I mean, no reason why that should change in RPM. Um, so what else on triggers? Um, they get uh, executed if the matching package gets installed or, uh, or uninstalled, depending on what type of trigger it is. So the, the execution is um, independent of the package that actually contains it. So it's something happening when somewhere else something happens. That's the trick. The problem is the triggers are also executed if the package containing it are, is installed or updated. That's done on purpose um, to allow the scriptlet to, to, to work on the files that are or packages that have been installed before or to update something um, in case you need to change the implementation of whatever the trigger does. So, so if, if, you're, if you're taking care of something, like updating some cache, um, you can rebuild the cache if the cache format changes even if only your package changed, not, and you don't have to reinstall all the other packages which would actually trigger the cache update. So that's uh, something to be aware of, that a trigger can fire when you don't expect it. So think about <laughs> the, cr the crossbow being <laughs> pointed in all kinds of directions, probably yours, <laughs> and, and uh, make sure that you program your, uh, your triggers so that they don't break anything if they get discharged on accident. So, gun safety. Did I miss anything? So, in file triggers are basically the same thing. In opposite to the normal triggers, we have uh, one, one trigger level less because we don't do anything before the package gets installed because there are no files there. And so we kind of figure that's not that useful to do something with files that are not there yet. Um, but in addition to, this, to those three uh, times, so basically after the files got installed, before the files get removed, and after the files get removed, there's another set of triggers 
which run um, um, basically uh, at the beginning or at the end of the transaction. So the trigger us only run once per transaction. The idea here is the problem is one thing why, why these scripts are so fucking annoying is because they are executed so many times. Every time you have to spin up a bash or whatever, and it takes a lot of time. So when people are complaining about RPM being slow, yes, RPM does some things very thoroughly, but most of the time it's actually spent in some trigger or some scriptlets. Uh, kernel, I'm looking at you. Um, uh, uh, which run all kind of software and just takes time, and the less we execute them, the less often we have to spin up a bash or whatever, that the more quickly we can do updates. So that's the uh, idea with the trans triggers. So the, um, they're basically either um, done after the installation uh, of everything or before the tr uh, transaction for files that are going to be removed or after the transaction for files that are then removed. So the question is, if you're executed after the transaction, how do you know what actually happened? And so we actually um, give you the list of files that are affected uh, through, the com uh, through the standard in. So you can read them if you're interested. If you're just updating some kind of cache, you may not be interested and just rebuild the cache. Um, um, as they are scripted, they share all the other um, parameters with the normal scriptlet, so you can give an, an, an interpreter and stuff like this. Um, we added also a priority, which allows you to basically order the, 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 the file triggers uh, in which, uh, to give an order in which they are executed, one after the other, because that might be um, um, important for some use cases. Maybe not, maybe there. So we basically have, yes? Uh, I saw Coded it in Lua, is that because it does not depend on bash? So, do you have to do that on every package which does not depend on bash? Um, you don't have to, but if. It's recommended? Or the, the thing with Lua is every script, you have to, when you have a script lab, you have to ask yourself when is this going to be executed? And if it is executed at the beginning of a transaction, with an empty system, you cannot call bash because there's no bash there. That's is basically. There something like that? I mean, if you have. Uh, uh, the, the other one was after installation for removal, and if there's no, nothing on the system yet, there's no. Before you, have, uh, you, have, you have the normal trigger, file triggers, which are basically installed before, before the file. No, okay. there's only okay. after the files la are laid down. Okay. So. That should probably yeah. So, if you're not ordered, uh, if yeah, so, so if you're if you're a core package which is installed before Bash, you probably need to use UR. So, but maybe if you, if you're that if you're that core, maybe you can do without file triggers. I don't know. <laughs> maybe you have other things to do. I don't. Yeah. But but for those cases, you will you will need uh, a Lua. Yeah, but it's, it's basically one of those, all those, all those other scriptlet stuff still applies. So that, and, and Lua script, scripting is basically one of those other things. Yeah. And, yeah. So, uh, mustn't there be like uh, an interpreter for Lua? No, Lua is actually uh, part of RPM itself. So it's built in, it's, it's part of the RPM process, which might come from some magic place like an Anaconda or whatever. Or, or the, the, the world outside of your install route. And so that's why it's used, why we're using Lua. It's part of RPM, so it can be used even on an empty system. That's the whole, what the whole fuss is about. So, and I did a quick trap on the, on the, on the, on the spec files of Fedora, of the current Fedora tree. And it looks like it's pretty used a lot already. The thing is, one wants to think, hey, eight, nine scriptlets is not much, but you have to keep in mind that each of those triggers basically replaces all the scriptlets in the, all the packages that put files there. So, 
there. And so, so even if, if the whole distribution in the end has only maybe 30, 40, 50 of those triggers, that's a, good, so that's a huge thing because it replaces maybe 5, 10, 20, 50 times more of scriptlets. And that's, I think, where we want to go in the long run. And all of those that we have already are basically updating some caches. So they are all very simple. They are basically just do whatever, whatever cache tool update thing they have. They just call it and be done with it. Uh, with the exception of systemd, which actually reloads the configuration of the systemd modules or whatever they are called. Units. I, units. Yes. Um, so. Are those generally per file or per transaction? You can choose. You can no, choose. I've uh, looked at the usage so far. Are we doing these per transaction or per, per file? I should have looked it up. I've, I've looked into some, but I, I, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that, that should be transaction unless it's a cache that's maybe needed by other scriptlets. Yeah. That's basically the, 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 the whole scriptlet story. Again, if you need to update something that's needed during the transaction, do it now, otherwise use the transaction uh, scriptlet. Okay, that's uh, file triggers. There's a bit of documentation I heard. Um, next thing, we need to get going. One question. One quick question. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of scriptlet which the crossbow is pointing at and which are likely <laughs> to get shot. So the ne next, next big thing is, is, is the Boolean dependencies. If there are no questions left for the file triggers, otherwise we can do questions at the end. Um, it's one of my big things that I wanted to do for, for, for like ages and it's finally there. It's basically you can now use Boolean expressions within dependencies. Um, it is important to understand that the to rights will stay simple. I actually thought about also making them Boolean expressions, but things get crazy if you screw that. The, the, the thing is, with provides being simple, uh, the stuff that RPM does can still basically be done statically, like just checking every Boolean expression if it is true or false. If you start having Boolean expressions on the other side, you basically have to do what DNF does, like real depth solving, checking what stuff actually needs to be what to get to a thing, and we said no, basically. Right now, there are uh, four operators. It's and, it's or, it's if, which is basically the reverse uh, um, implication. And there's if else, which basically gives the forward implications as a third term. Um, um, yes? Uh, how will the dashboard trick wars uh, work with this? So if, if, I have, if this uh, some package requires foo or bar, so what, what requires foo will return that? That's, that's, that's an excellent question. Did I say I will talk about what requires next year? <laughs> <laughs> The thing is, it, it currently doesn't really work, and what, what, uh, one of this is because we need to figure, still figure it out. And the, and the next thing is, yes, there for the reverse uh, query, there's no, not really an answer, which 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 fits the same question that we had before. It basically you can either say, well, it only fits if you actually really match the full term. Or you can say, well, these are all the terms that might fit somehow. Some of them might even prevent that thing from matching if it's in the wrong place of the term, but uh, we will show it to you anyway. So that's, yeah, I, I still have to look into this, thing, to be honest. So, yeah. Whatever you do, will work. Yeah. It. yeah, it's an issue, and we will document it. So I have an example here. Um, so you can. Um, the thing is, 
it is as, as a feature, it is much more complicated than, for example, the files triggers. The file triggers is you have a use case, you have script that you need to run, and you just use it, and it, and it works. The problem here is it's more like a toolbox. And to be honest, I also have I have a few ideas how it can be used, but it's very, very unclear what it's actually going to be like to be widely used in the, in the distribution and what corner cases people might be able to come up to actually do with it. It also interacts very nicely with the weak dependencies we just added, so you have a huge plethora of, of things you can do now, and it's uh, difficult to get uh, a grip on what actually should be done. So maybe we can do that in a little discussion there in, 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 the, in, the, in the question session. The example we have here is, is, is the stuff that's actually currently been worked on, which are like file uh, language packages. And you can basically do uh, a supplement, which is a weak reverse dependency. It's, a, it's basically, so it would be part of the, of the language pack. And it says uh, supplement, which basically means install me if, if my main package gets installed and the language I'm providing is also installed. So what the people are working right now is basically having uh, meta packages that are empty that basically represent the language and all the lang packs can basically attach to there and be installed automatically if the language support for this given language is installed on the system. So this is also basically uh, replacing the, the if clauses we have in, in comps which has been traditionally used mainly for those language stuff, with some exceptions, but I don't know. Is it still in there? Do you, anyone know about comps? I haven't looked for a while. Conditionals are still available and they're still used in some places. Okay. But Okay, so, so I hear conditionals are still in comps, but they are no longer used because the language uh, langpack plugin does the work because the comp stuff didn't work so well, basically, for the rows in the back. Um, so I was crabbing through through the through the repository and, and was wondering how, how how is it used? It must be great, and uh, yeah there's exactly one package which has one, and basically uh, it looks a bit like, like this one. And that's it. So, no one cares. Not yet, not yet. No, so, so, it, so, so at least... Use this yet. So, so, so that package is not compliant. Um, uh, <laughs> this is the problem why nobody uses it, because we were told we shouldn't. So, 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 so instead to, to, to lift myself up a bit, I, I looked what weak depths are actually doing in, in, in the distribution and it looks like they uh, arrived there. So the, the numbers are compared to all dependencies in the distribution, maybe not that big, but it looks like there's, they are gaining some traction and, and, and getting used. And they are basically also getting used the way that is expected, like the Reverse uh, weak dependencies are used much less, only for a few cases, which is, I've not checked them yet because that's not my problem, um, but so maybe someone should. Um, but they are used much less than the forward ones, which are uh, supposed to be used as a default. And they are used on both uh, levels, the slightly stronger ones, that are used to basically allow people to deinstall packages which would otherwise be selected, and uh, really the suggests, which are basically hints telling the depth solver which package to choose in case there are multiple options. And so both of those are, are used to a good degree. Could be more, will get more. I'm, I'm optimistic about this. So, but. As, as in, we hear here, that's not the, the thing about one package using it. It's not the real whole picture. There are people are working on this. GLibc uh, mainly will is currently working on splitting out basically all the trans 
translations into sub packages, which end up like 180, if I thought, if I if I if I understood it correctly. So it's it's it's, it's a bunch. Um, of course, as always in RPM, if you try something completely new, you run into issues. Um, uh, turns out some libsolve and, and especially a vapor query is not yet 100% up to the task. Um, and also RPM broke horribly when they tried to generate uh, 180 sub packages out of one macro. Uh, for some reason, there's some buffer that uh, wasn't just dynamic enough and uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, 768 is the number. <laughs> Um, but as, as far as I see, uh, Lubos fixed that, and so they're on good track. And uh, I hope we will get to the point where we can then standardize their, their solution, maybe even put it as, as a standard macro in RPM upstream. And so, so other people will have much less work to do to split out their stuff. How much this is going to be used is still up to debate. That's not really an RPM upstream question. My guess is that there rather be maybe a handful of packages that are big enough to really split out everything into hundreds of sub packages. But that's up to this for other people to decide how fine the, the, the distribution wants to, to drain that. I expect there will be at least a handful of packages, maybe maybe more. We'll see. So I want to say a bit more how, the, how it works. Um, because the thing is, if you come with the, with the normal package or mindset and, and read those uh, relations, um, it's not like, like, the, like the Boolean expressions change much, but the, 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 the default mindset, at least I have, does no longer work. So if, if you read, you read, Package X requires this package. And for some things, this works nicely. It requires this package or this package. So, so, so the, the, the normal flow of, of reading it like a sentence works. But there are some points where it breaks down and you actually have to have a, have a model in your mind how it's actually working and, and, and it not just being some English sentence with parentheses in, in between. And so, the thing you have to realize is basically uh, whenever there's a name or a name and a version comparison, this is uh, translated into a Boolean value whether you find a match or not. So, so if you require package X and package X is there, that's getting a true. If package is not there in the to be completed translations, of course, always, we are always talking of, of the future, basically after the translation has successfully run. Um, if it's not there, then it is, this is going to be a false. And everything else is just Boolean operations, so the end is just as a normal Boolean end. It requires both sides to be true. The or requires one side to be true. And the if uh, is a reverse, yeah, which requires, uh, we have a flat slide for this. So, the <laughs> um, so whenever things get fishy, you can basically take a step back and say, well, that's all Boolean values, and I can figure out what expressions means by just imagining what's happening if some parts get true or false, and how this gets then combined. Um, and in the end, basically, most of the dependencies need to get true to work, or conflicts need to be false, of course. Otherwise, it is a conflict, and you cannot install. So it's basically... Uh, it requires with a not in, in front um, for those who think that's more easy to understand, but most probably don't. So the thing that's a bit, so and and or, or is actually pretty simple to understand. What's a bit tricky is, is the if operator, um, because it works very well if the, if the whole term is like positive. So if you have, for example, requires package A, if package B, 
that's nice and easy. If package B is, you also require the first package, and you basically you have to install them both then. And if you just install the first package, it doesn't matter because package B is not there and we don't care then. But of course, we don't care means the requires as a whole is true. The whole term has to be true, so the requires is fulfilled. And if we now put that in a an, in an conflict, being true is not like the default case we are looking for. Because, of course, you have to be false to, for the conflict not to affect or not to stop the transaction. So if you say conflicts package A if package B, and package B is not there, then the whole term is true and you have a conflict. And that's probably not what you want. If you want it, fine, but then you have something weird, complicated, and you've probably thought about it long enough that you don't need my talk. But, <laughs> but if you, <laughs> so, so the general rule is, if you can use and instead, and think it's the same thing, it's probably not, and you really should use and. <laughs> so that, that's basically the, the thing to take away. So that these ifs, as soon as they are used negatively or, or in, in, in a second example, as part of, so, of some or chain, where we are, you say, well, if nothing happens, it's okay if it's false because someone of the other packages then should be installed. Um, uh, so, so, so if the default basically should be zero or false, then the if is not typically what you're looking for. And if you replace the if by an end and, and the whole thing then actually still makes sense, then go, go with it. Is, is, I don't know, do I need more clarification on this if stuff, what it actually does? I mean, you can do, uh, of course, so, so, so truth tables and stuff like this. <laughs> and yeah, there, there's some documentation. Do it. Anyone needs the Morgan's rule? Just, just. Hmm? So, the, so the else is basically you say package A, if package B, else package C. And it's it's just um, yeah I should have had an example here uh, on on the documentation page there's an example for this and it basically means if the package is installed and we require this package and if it's not installed you still require another package it's not really necessary to have this as an operator so you can do that otherwise but it's I think the syntax is, is so nice that I just had to add it you can basically make it with a second line. Um, uh, oh, do I get it out of my mind? Uh, um, so if uh, the else means if if not, I, I'm not doing this by heart. <laughs> so, but in the end, um, it's it's basically just an uh, it's just basically a compound which you can have with two lines of thing, one an if, and I think one an, an, an and or something, which means the same thing, but the if, the if then else is somehow, I think, cleaner, and it shows more that you have an alternative depending on the packages not being there, so, so it's, it's nicer, it's syntactic sugar, basically. So, that's basically it. <laughs> Can you speak a bit up? I can't. Yeah. Does it work with a uh, dependent, why it's different dependent of other than names? Just like Perl? Uh, yeah, that, that works. The, 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 I hope. Uh, the, the, there, there's, the, 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 the thing is, you have to have the, the parentheses for, for these operators have to be basically the beginning of, 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 of words. There's some special code which allows, like, basically closing the parentheses if there's still some open. But, yeah, you should test it. 
but um, Yeah, the thing is, I thought about it first, the not operator. So the th I always had the feeling that uh, the not operator is clearly missing. The problem is, I have not been able to come up with a use case for it. And I asked people to come up with a use case. And all the use cases they came up with were, were like, don't do this. There's, you can do that with a different thing, which is more clear, and, and, and it just complicated things. So if you can have, if you can come up with a use case, where, where the not operator really is uh, useful and actually looks more beautiful than an alternative, please come to me. I probably forgot uh, the second part, which answer was no. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>